The Last Leaf by O. Henry In a little district west of Washington Square, the streets have run crazy and broken themselves into small strips called places. These places make strange angles and curves. The street crosses itself a time or two. An artist once discovered a valuable possibility in the street. Suppose a collector with a bill for paints, paper, and canvas should, in traversing this route, suddenly meet himself coming back, without a sense having been paid on account. So to quaint old Greenwich Village, the art people soon came prowling, hunting for north windows and 18th century gables and Dutch attics and low rents. And they imported some pewter mugs and chafing dish or two from 6th Avenue and became a colony. At the top of the squatty three-story brick, Sue and John C., they had their studio. John C. was familiar for Joanna. One was from Maine, the other was from California. They had met at the table de Haute in a 8th Street Delmonico's. They found their taste in art, chicory, salad, and bishop sleeves so congenial that the joint studio resulted. That was in May. In November, a cold, unseen danger and the doctors called pneumonia, stalked the colony. Touching one here and there with his icy fingers, over on the east side this ravenger strode boldly, smiting his victims with scores, but his feet trod slowly through the maze of the narrow and mass moss-grown places. Mr. Pneumonia was not what you would call a sh chivalric old gentleman, a mite, of little woman with blood thinned by California zephyrs was hardly fair game for the red-fisted, short-breathed old duffer. But John Z he smote, and she lay scarcely moving on her painted iron bedstead, looking through the small Dutch window panes at the blank side of the brick house, no, next brick house. One morning, the busy doctor invited Sue into the hallway with a shaggy gray eyebrow. She has one chance in let us say ten, he said, as he shook down the mercury in his clinical thermometer, and that chance is for her to want to live. This way people have of lining of the side of the undertaker makes the entire pharmacopoeia look silly. Your little lady had made up her mind that she's not going to get well. Has any has she anything on her mind? She, she wanted to paint the Bay of Naples someday, said Sue. Paint? Bosh. Has she anything on her mind worth thinking twice for a man? For instance, a man, said Sue, with Jew's harp twang in her voice, and a man's worth, but no doctor. There is nothing of the kind. What well, is the weakness then, said the doctor. I will do all that science so far as it may filter through my efforts can accomplish. But whenever my patient begins to count the carriages in her funeral procession, I subtract 50% from the curative powers of medicines. If you will get her to ask one question about the new winter styles and cloak sleeves, I'll promise you a 1 in 5 chance of her instead of 1 in 10. After the doctor had gone, Sue went into the workroom and cried a Japanese napkin to a pulp. Then she swaggered into John Z's room with her drawing board whistling ragtime. John Z lay scarcely making a ripple under the bedclothes with her face towards the window. Sue stopping, stopped whistling, thinking she was asleep. She arranged her board and began a pen and ink drawing to illustrate a magazine story. Young artists must pave their way to art by drawing pictures for magazine stories that young authors write to pave their way to literature. As Sue was sketching a pair of elegant horseshoe riding trousers and a monocle of the figure of the hero, an Idaho cowboy, she heard a low sound several times repeated. She went quickly to the bedside. John C.'s eyes were wide open. She was looking out the window and counting, counting backward. Twelve, she, she said, a little later eleven, and then ten, and nine, and then eight, and seven, and almost together. Sue looked solicitously out the window. What was there to count? There was only a bare dreary yard to be seen. 
in the blank side of a brick house 20 feet away, an old, old ivy vine gnarled and decayed at the roots, climbed halfway up the brick wall. The cold breath of autumn had stricken its leaves from the vine until its skeleton branches clung almost bare to the crumbling bricks. What is it, dear? asked Sue. Six, said Johnny, in almost a whisper. They're falling faster now. Three days ago, they were almost a hundred. It made my head ache to count them, but now it's easy. There goes another one. There are only five left now. Five what, dear? Tell you, sweetie. Leaves on the ivy vine. When the last one falls, I must go too. I've known that for three days, didn't the doctor tell you? I've never heard of such nonsense, complained Sue, the magni with magnificent scorn. What have old ivy leaves to do with your getting well? And you used to love that vine so, you naughty girl. Don't be a goosey. Why, the doctor told me this morning that your chances for getting well real soon were, let's see exactly what he said. He said the chances were 10 to 1. Why, that's almost as good as a chance as we have in New York when we ride on the streetcars or walk past a new building. Try to take some breath, broth now. Let Sweetie go back to her drawing so she can sell the editor man with it and buy port wine for her sick child and pork chops for her greedy self. You needn't get, get any more wine, said John Z. Keeping her eyes fixed out the window, there goes another one. No, I don't want any broth. That leaves just four. I want to see that last one fall before it gets dark, then I'll go too. John Z. Deer, said, said Sue, bending over her. Will you promise to keep your eyes closed and not look out the window until I am done working? I must hang those drawings in by tomorrow. I need the light, or I could draw the shade down. Couldn't you draw the other room? asked John Z. coldly. I'd rather be here with by you, said Sue. Beside, I don't want you to keep looking at those silly ivy leaves. Tell me as soon as you have finished, said John Z, closing her eyes and lying white as still as fallen statue, because I want to see the last one fall. I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of thinking. I want to turn loose my hold on everything and go sailing down, down, just like one of those poor tired leaves. Try to sleep, said Sue. I must recall Berman up to be my model for the old hermit miner. I'll not be gone a minute. Don't try to move till I'll come back. Old Berman was a painter who lived on the ground floor beneath them. He was past 60 and he had Michelangelo's Moses beard curling down from the head of a satyr along the body of an imp. Berman was a failure in art. 40 years he had wielded the brush without getting near enough to touch the hem of his mistress's robe. He had, he had been always about to paint a masterpiece, but had never yet begun it. For several years, he had painted nothing except now and then a daub in the line of commerce of advertising. He earned a little by serving as a model to those young artists in the colony who could not pay the price of a professional. He drank gin to excess and still talked of his coming masterpiece. For the rest, he was a fierce little old man who scoffs terribly at softness in anyone, and he regarded himself as a special mastiff in waiting to protect the two young artists in the studio above. Sue found Behrman smelling strongly of juniper berries in his dimly lighted den below. In one corner was a blank canvas on an easel that had been waiting there for 25 years to receive the first line of the masterpiece. She told him of John Z's fancy, how she feared she would indeed, light and fragile as a leaf herself, float away when her slight hold upon the world grew weaker. Old Behrman, with his red eyes plainly streaming, sh shrouded, shouted his contempt and derision for such imaginings. Vast, he cried, is there people in the world admit their foolishness to die because leaves they drop off a confounded vine? I have not heard of such thing. No, I do not boast as a model for your fool hermit dunderhead. But I do allow dot silly f punis to come in der brain of her. Act dot per little Miss John Yonzi. 
She is very ill and weak, said Sue, and the fever has left her mind morbid and full of strange fancies. Very well, Miss, Mr. Berman. If you do not care to pose for me, you, in, you needn't. But I think you are horrid, old, old, flibber gibbet. You are like a woman, yelled Berman, who said I will not pose. Go on, I come with you. For half an hour I have been trying to stay. Say, Dot, I am ready to pose. Got, this is not any place to which one so good as Miss Jonesy shall lick, sit, lie sick. Someday I will vaint a masterpiece, and we shall all go away. G got, yes. Jonesy was sleeping when they went upstairs. She pulled the shade down the window sill and motioned Berman into the side, into the other room. And there they peered out the window, fearfully at the ivy vine, and looked at each other for a moment without speaking. A persistent cold rain was falling, mingled with snow. Berman, in his old blue shirt, took his seat as the hermit miner on an upturned kettle for a rock. When Sue awoke for an hour's sleep the next morning, she found John Z with dull, wide-open eyes, staring at the d drawn green shade. Pull it up, I want to see, she ordered in a whisper. Rarely Sue obeyed, but low after beating the rain, the fierce gusts of wind that had endured through the live-long night, there stood, there yet stood out against the brick wall, one ivy leaf. It was the last one on the vine, still dark green near its stem, with its surrogate edges, tinted with yellow dissolution and decay. It hung bravely from the branch, some twenty feet above the ground. It's the last one, says John Z. I thought it would surely fall during the night. I heard the wind. It will fall today, and I shall die at the same time. Dear, dear, said Sue, leaning her worn face to the pillow. Think of me. If you won't think of yourself, what should I do? But John Z did not answer. The lonesomest thing in all the world is a soul when it is making ready to go on its mysterious far journey. The fancy seemed to possess her more strongly, as one by one the ties that bound her to friendship and to earth were loosed. The day wore away, and even though the twilight they could see, the lone ivy leaf clinging to its stem against the wall, and then with the coming of the night the north was again loosed, while the rain still beat against the windows and pattered down from the low Dutch eaves. When it was light enough, John Z, the merciless, commanded that shade be raised. The ivy leaf was still there. John Z lay for a long time, looking at it. And she looked to Sue, who was stirring her chicken broth over the gas stove. I've been a bad girl, Sudi, said John Z. Something has made the last leaf stay there to show me how wicked I was. It is a sin to want to die. You may want you may bring me a little broth now, some milk, some little port in it, and no, bring me a hand mirror first, and then pack some pillows about me. I will sit up and watch you cook. An hour li later, she said, Sudi, someday I hope to paint the Bay of Naples. The doctor came in the afternoon, and Sue had an excuse to go into the hallway as he left. Even chances, said the doctor, taking Sue's thin, shaking hand in his, with good nursing you'll win. And now I must see another case I have downstairs. Berman, his name is, some kind of an artist, I believe. Pneumonia too, he is old and weak man. And the attack is acute. There is no home for him, and he goes to the hospital de today to be made comfortable. The next day the doctor said to Sue, she's out of danger, you won. Nutrition and care, now, that's all. And that afternoon, Sue came to bed where Johnsy lay, contently knitting a very blue and very useless wooden shoulder scarf, put one arm around her, pillows and all. I have something to tell you, White Mouse, she said. Mr. Berman died of pneumonia today in the hospital. He was ill only two days. The janitor found him the morning of the first day in his room downstairs, helpless with pain. His shoes and clothing were wet through with icy cold. They couldn't imagine where he had been on such a dreadful night. And then they found a lantern, still lighted, and a ladder that had been dragged from its place in some scattered bushes, and a pallet with green and yellow colors mixed on it. And look out the window, dear, at the last ivy leaf on the wall. 
Didn't you wonder why it never fluttered or moved when the wind blew? Ah, darling, it's Berman's masterpiece. He painted it there the night the last leaf fell. So that was The Last Leaf by O. Henry. Um, I'm going to be honest, I didn't understand that story at all. Okay, I didn't understand it at all. Part of the reason I read these stories on here is to stimulate my mind because I don't, I'm not very good at reading, generally speaking. I have poor memory retention. I, like I'll read something and I'll completely forget what it said or like somebody will say something to me and I have a really, really bad memory and they'll forget what they said like immediately after. One of the reasons why I'm trying to read stories on YouTube is because I'm trying to improve my memory. I'm trying to improve my critical thinking. I'm trying to improve my, under my understanding skills. Maybe 75% of the stories I've read so far, I've understood most of what they were about. This is one of the stories I've, I um, it's part of the 25% that I do not understand what it was about. I do not understand it at all. But I think that's totally fine. I think when you read a story, you don't have to understand it. It's sort of like the Bible. If you read the Bible, you don't have to understand the Bible. It could be completely mysterious and it can be completely obtuse, but you read it anyway because you want to become a more intelligent person. You want to have more sensitivity and you want to develop a more thoughtful personality. That's why you read it. You don't read it to... You don't read it to impress anybody. You don't read it, you don't read it to impress... I'm not trying to impress you with my communication about the story. That's not why I'm reading. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this for me. I'm doing this to improve my understanding, to improve my reading skills, improve my intelligence. I'm not doing this to impress you. If you, if you. if you think that was good reading, I don't care. I don't care. If you think it's bad reading, I don't care. What scares me also is maybe I did understand the story, and maybe I was so bored with the story that I, it was so dull that it bored me with its dullness. Maybe, oh, oh, Henry, I just find a boring writer. I, I read it, The Last Magi, or whatever, Gift of the Magi, whatever, <laughs> like The Last Jedi, Last Magi, no, The Gift of the Magi. Um, I read that story, that story was dull too. I think, oh, Henry is just a dull writer. I think he's dull, and I kind of like that about him. I kind of like how dull he is. Oh, just a story about a guy dying and a guy making a painting and somebody eating some soup or drinking some milk. Is that what happened? Somebody drinks some soup, somebody... May is painting something and somebody died at the end of the thing. I guess that's what you want a story to be about. Somebody making a painting, somebody eating some soup, and somebody dying at the end of it. What else would you want a story to be about? It's supposed to be dull. I think this story is supposed to be dull. And I'm supposed to obsess over how dull it is and get a whiplash in the dullness of it. But that's what life is. Life is dull, you get it? Life is dull. Life, that's the point of the story, is life is dull. And then you die. You make a painting, you finish when you die. The point of the story is it's dull. It's dull. What do you want me to say? I, I, I want to say I don't understand it because I feel like I've missed something in the story. Because I'm so, when I was a kid, I was spent so many years watching movies like Star Wars and The Matrix and all these action packed movies, playing all these video games like Battlefield and Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto. I have a short attention span because I've been playing video games all my life. And I read this story, I'm supposed to. Okay. This story where nothing happens. It's like Seinfeld, where nothing happens. And I'm supposed to read this story and say, Okay, that was really great. That was really great. They, they, they ate some milk, or they ate some soup, and they died at the end. There was a painting. Painting of some leaves. I don't under... I, I feel like there's something I'm missing that I don't understand. That's always been my problem when I read stories, when I read books. I feel like I don't understand it because it's so dull. It's so dull. I, I guess that's the point, is it's supposed to be dull. You're supposed to just listen to the characters. Oh, Johnny. Oh, Johnny's a, I guess it was a girl. A girl named Johnny. Okay, great. A girl named Johnny. So it's like, it's supposed to be like confusing or something? Like, I don't know. Yeah, I know there's girls named Johnny. There's girls named all sorts of names. I don't, I'm not surprised at that. I'm just surprised that they wrote that in the year like 1900, 120 years ago. They wrote a story about a girl named Johnny. How does that make any sense? I didn't know there was girls named Johnny 120 years ago. What? Okay, if you say so. You're telling me that's... I didn't know there's girls named Johnny 120 years ago. I know there's girls named Johnny today. I didn't know there's girls named Johnny 120 years ago, but... I guess P 
people like different names, and that's fine. I'm I'm open to all different names. I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I don't. It just it just confuses me because it's supposed to be thought provoking. That's the point of the story. Is it's supposed to be thought provoking? It's just, but there was nothing that happened. It, it's like a story of nothing happening, and it just it's just frustrating. It's like my life. My life is nothing happening. And dr drink some milk, you know, and have some soup. Make a painting and I die. That's that's what my life is. That's what my life is. And that's that's what this story is. It's, it's just about nothing. So what I do here is I make these vlogs about myself at the end of these stories instead of just making vlogs about myself because I want to give you my reaction to the story. I want to tell you what I thought about it. Okay, instead of making a vlog where it's just 20 minutes of me talking about myself, I'm going to read a story and then I'm going to tell you how I react to the story. This is my, it's like movie criticism. It's like my literary criticism. That, that's how I reacted to it. You probably reacted to it completely different. You probably you probably thought it was totally engaging because you, sp you didn't spend twenty years of your life playing action-packed video games and stuff, and and like if your attention span morphed to zero because because you've been wasting your life away. So you probably thought it was engaging. You probably thought it was oh yeah, it was a really exciting story. I think it was I think it was it was supposed to be dull. I think. It was supposed to be a snapshot of everyday life. Oh yeah, that's what life is. Make some paintings, you have some soup, and then you die. That's what life is, right? Hmm? That's what life is. What else is there? Nothing. Nothing else. So I do this little vlog after the, after the, um, after the story, and it's really great. It's a really enjoyable vlog. It's a really enjoyable vlog. The story, I, it, it, I feel the same way when I read the Bible, honestly. I feel the same way when I read the Bible because it's like, I, I, that's why I never read the Bible. That's why I never read stories growing up because I don't want anything thought-provoking. I got enough thought-provoking things when I went to school, when I went to go to college, when I dropped out of college. When I went to work, I used to have enough thought-provoking things, but now I don't have anything to do in my day because I only work 10 hours a week. So i got to read this stupid thought-provoking stuff that's supposed to challenge my critical thinking skills and to realize what the, what is it talking about? What the heck is it talking about? And I have to think, what, like, what is the point of the story? What, what, is, what is the point of what, what is it saying? How am I supposed to know? How am I supposed to know what it's saying? You tell me. You tell me what the story's saying. I don't know. I don't know what the story's saying. I don't know. Some, I just read the top... I, I type in short stories on Google, and then Google tells me the top 50 short stories that people search for on Google, and then, and then Google just tells me the top ones and on their bar. You can scroll through the bar, and they just recommend me a story. Oh, Henry, what is it called again? The Last Leaf. Oh, what a story, The Last Leaf. And of course, I can't read Ray Bradbury, or I can't read something science fiction, because that'll stress me out. I read action-packed stuff, or science fiction stuff, or I can't even read Edgar Allan Poe, and it will probably stress me out. So I gotta read this dull, dull stuff, because anything more intense will stress me out. So I gotta read this dull material. Oh my god, it's so dull. It's so dull. Oh, well, it's me. I'm reading a dull story, and I'm talking about it on YouTube. Oh. Whatever. I don't care. This is the best way for me to spend my time, read dull stories on YouTube. Good. 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 Why not? What else am I going to do with my time? What else am I going to do? Really? What else am I going to do? Oh, yeah. They wish and they wish and they wish it on me. God's plan. They wish and they wish and they wish it on me. God's plan. Anyways, let me know what you thought of... Um... The Last Leaf by O. Henry. I thought it was a snoozer, an absolute snoozer. Maybe that's what I want. Maybe I want to put my brain to inertia. Maybe that's what I'm looking to read right now, because I can't read anything more intense than this without being stressed out. So let me know what you thought of The Last Leaf by O. Henry. Oh, Henry. Oh, Henry. Um, so let me know what you thought of The Last Leaf by O. Henry. Um, I thought it was a snoozer. Um, please subscribe to this channel to be part of the community, 
And please like this video. It really helps out the channel a lot. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.